So just a reminder for everybody who may have missed a class, these classes are being recorded, so feel free to go back and uh, listen to anything that you missed or, or if you want clarification on any of that. Um, those are going to be on uh, SoundCloud. Um, and I believe, I'm not sure if there's a link on the website. Yes. Adrian, there, are, there is a link on the website. Okay, good. Um, and all the classes are there too, so you can get uh, the other classes that are going on right now. You can listen to those as well if you're interested. And uh, we're going to be covering Gnosticism this morning. So fair warning, it gets a little complex and a little weird. So I will make sure to stop now and then to just make sure you all are doing OK. If there's any clarifications that need to be made, uh, go ahead and let me know. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for an amazing lesson this morning. And so relevant to our times, we just pray that that which was said this morning uh, will dwell in our hearts and that we would stand firm in the foundation of your word in the face of secular humanism and neo-paganism and all these things that are assaulting your truth today. And we're going to look at something like that this morning, something that is known as the enduring heresy, Gnosticism, something that assaulted the early church in the second and third century, and we just pray that as we study it, we will recognize it for what it is, as, as falsehood, and that we would seek to refute it and understand your truth even better in light of it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So if there was ever a heresy that warrants the title of arch heresy, or that could be viewed as preeminent among the heresies, it would be Gnosticism. It started to gain popularity in the second century AD, a time when the infant church was for the first time left without the guiding influence of a living apostle. John the Apostle had died right around the turn of the century. The church as a whole was still compiling the canon of scripture. Not only that, but the Christian faith was still illegal, and so the saints were still enduring periodic waves of persecution from external antagonists. From a human perspective, it was a very vulnerable time for the infant church. And it was at this moment in history that Gnosticism was hitting its stride, a belief system that though it claimed to be the true expression of Christianity, was in many ways the exact opposite of all that the scriptures teach. In its language and external presentation, it could appear to be very similar to that of the Christian faith, though its core beliefs regarding this world, salvation, and our place in it, it could not be further from the truth. As Douglas Greenlees, a modern Gnostic, says, in its wording, Gnosticism is Christian, while its spirit is that of the latest paganism of the West. And though its heyday was relatively short-lived, lasting only a few centuries, it was nevertheless a very insidious and dangerous heresy that's influence and impact on cultural and religious thought are still evident to this day. And that is why Gnosticism has been called the enduring heresy. I have become convinced that though we could label all heresies in some sense as demonic, or see them as being introduced in some fashion by Satan, who himself is the father of lies, Gnosticism is blatantly, obviously, and preeminently a work of the devil. And hopefully in the course of this class I can demonstrate and convince you that my conclusion is not in any way overstated. So, what is Gnosticism? What did it teach, and where did it come from? The Gnostics taught a dualistic view of reality, that the physical world was inherently evil and corrupt, and that the spiritual was good and pure. Also, there was a perception in the Gnostic thought that this physical existence was an illusion or a facade, veiling the single spiritual unity of all things. They taught that salvation was obtained through secret knowledge, knowledge, the Greek word for knowledge, gnosis, right? So they become known as the Gnostics. So it's the salvation is obtained through secret knowledge as opposed to the gospel, right? Which is proclaimed openly uh, and, and proclaimed without distinction to all, right? When Paul says to King Agrippa, none of these things has escaped the king's notice for these things were not done in a corner, right? That's the truth of the gospel. But when it comes to Gnosticism, it is a secret, esoteric, 
knowledge. And it was through this acquisition of this secret knowledge that one could be released from this present evil physical reality and ascend to the spiritual realm and escape from this corporeal prison. As a movement, it was really an amalgamation or a hybrid of multiple other streams of religious thought. So at its root, it was by nature syncretistic. And as Gnosticism grew and entered other areas of the world, it had no trouble integrating different aspects of the regional religions of its day into its own system. As Gnosticism expert Kurt Rudolph says, with reference to its interaction with Christianity, quote, it was a parasite prospering on the soil of the Christian religion, unquote. Now, though it was a prominent movement in the second and third century, its true origins are unknown. The prevailing thought is that Gnostic tendencies started to develop at the same time as the early church. At the same time that the early church was expanding and growing, Gnosticism was starting to take root. This would explain some of the anti-Gnostic polemics that we see in the New Testament, because these tendencies were already starting to cause issues in the first century Christian community. But these tendencies did not really become a full-blown movement until the second century, once its adherents had developed their own theology and established their own Gnostic scriptures. So though we don't know exactly when it started, we can identify the different religious ideologies that eventually gave rise to it. So fundamentally, there are three main contributing religious systems that the Gnostics drew from. Eastern religion, specifically Persian and Babylonian religion, Jewish mysticism, and Greek Platonic thought. Before we get into the details, again, disclaimer, stuff gets pretty weird, we're about to get into it. If I need to slow down, if there's any clarification needed, feel free to throw up your hand and uh, we'll address it. And also, the Gnostic movements of the second and third century were not monolithic, right? They didn't all believe the exact same thing. So each Gnostic group would have different spins and variations uh, when it comes to their creation myths and doctrines that they taught. So I'll do my best to accurately represent them, though uh, for the sake of time, we'll have to generalize and skip some things, but we'll make sure to hit the big points. So to get the taste of their ideology, I want us to consider three major topics. I want to look at their cosmology, that is their view of creation and their view of this world. I want us to look at how this relates to their soteriology, that was their concept of salvation. And I want us to examine how this ultimately worked itself out in the way they lived. That is, how did their view of this world and the way they viewed salvation affect the way their communities lived their lives? And we'll see that it eventually, it either resulted in <coughs> asceticism, the harsh treatment of the body, or antinomianism, which is licentiousness. Those were the two paths that this worldview resulted in. So what was Gnosticism's cosmology? The Gnostic view of God really isn't a personal God, like the God of the Bible. The supreme being in Gnosticism is this thing called the monad, or the one. It is an elementary, indivisible substance and refers to the totality of all things. It is pure light and pure being, the source of all existence. And this thing, this thing is the ultimate God of Gnosticism. Well, at some point in the past, this Gnostic God emanated or birthed or brought forth certain other entities called aeons. And he's not really creating these things but emanating is almost like thinking them into existence, emanating them into existence. These aeons are what can be described as personified ideas or characteristics of the one God. So the one ultimate source emanates these other quote unquote beings and they're called things like thought and mind and truth and life and word, right? So again, kind of abstract, but um, you get the idea, hopefully. And they have a certain hierarchy among them, and their numbers vary depending on which Gnostic story you're looking at. But I'm not going to go too in-depth on that, but all of these aeons act kind of like angels, if we were to kind of put a Christian idea to it, right? They, they kind of act like angelic beings, even though they're not personal beings, okay? Um, but all these aeons, together with the one, consist of what Gnostics call the pleroma, or the fullness. And this is kind of like the highest realm 
of existence, right? That is the fullness. And this will be important when it comes to the Gnostic view of salvation that we will come to in a bit. Now, the lowest of these aeons was Sophia. Now, if you're familiar with Greek, who is Sophia? Who is she? Sophia means wisdom, right? So she is divine wisdom. She's the lowest on the totem pole of these, these, these divine beings. Sophia's at the very, very bottom. <clears throat> now, aeons in the fullness were all paired up. It's almost like they each had an aeon spouse, right? To keep it kind of simple. Um, and so two aeons could get together and emanate or bring forth another aeon. And there's a family tree to all of this, but there's no way we're going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> but what happens next is that the Gnostic, in the Gnostic myth, is that Sophia, wisdom, decides to bring forth a being apart from her partner. Right? She has her Aeon spouse, but she decides to bring forth a being on her own. And the result is a deformed being brought forth out of ignorance. Sophia is afraid that the other Aeons will find out about this, so she casts her illegitimate son out of the Pleroma, and her son, the misshapen being that was cast out, goes by many names. There is the Demiurge, that means maker, Yaltaba Oath, the child of chaos, Saklas, the fool, Samael, the blind one. Who is this character in the Gnostic myth? Any guesses? Hercules, no. In our, if, in, if you were going to ascribe a, a counterpart to this character in Christian terms, who do you think this would be? Satan. Everybody says Satan, and that's exactly the opposite of who this is. This is Yahweh, the Judeo-Christian God. I told you, it's twisted. <laughs> All right, we're going to keep going. In Gnosticism, this is where Yahweh comes from. He is, according to Gnostic thought, an evil, ignorant, malevolent being who is convinced that he is the only true God and is unaware of the fullness and the pleroma above him. That's why he's called the fool or the blind one. And Gnostics, well, let's, let's stop for a second. Uh, <laughs> any questions on that? Other than the initial shock on all of your faces, I think you, I think you get it, right? Okay, we're, we're clear so far? Um, so this misshapen deity, the Demiurge, Yahweh, is the creator of this world. Now, this is obviously antithetical to the biblical account. As Christians, we believe that God, the God of this world, Yahweh, the only true God, created a good world. Indeed, after he created humanity, he says it was very good. Genesis 131 and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And so as to the nature of God, his supremacy as the only true God, and as to the nature of the physical world, Gnosticism and Christianity are in complete opposition. Remember, Gnostics taught that the material world was inherently corrupt. And though we as Christians would concede the fact that suffering and evil exist in creation, right, in this world, we would attribute this to the fact that we live in a fallen world, and this fall is ultimately a result of human sin and rebellion. While the Gnostics would attribute suffering and evil to the nature of the physical world itself, right? So that's a huge difference. We say God is good, and he created a good world that we messed up. Gnostics attribute the evil in this world to the direct intention of its creator. And so for the Gnostics, the state of creation is the way it is because Yahweh created, the, created it this way, inherently evil. Which kind of gives us a glimpse into the Gnostic mindset. There is an intrinsic pessimism in Gnostic thought that, though wicked and a great deception, is at the same time kind of tragic. Think about this for a second. The people who conceived this view of God looked at the world around them and the suffering, death, and what they perceived as absurd evil and came to this conclusion. This world is full of absurd and purposeless suffering and evil. Therefore, the creator of this world must be evil and cruel. And they pointed to what they perceived as atrocious acts of God in the Old Testament to validate that claim. And one of the, the original Gnostics was called uh, Martion. And he just basically took the Old Testament and was like, yeah, that's not scripture. 
and uh, I don't like that in the New Testament, that in the New Testament, and that in the New Testament, right? And he just started chopping his Bible up, right? Um, and he fundamentally said, yeah, the Old Testament, Gnostics basically said the Old Testament God is evil, right? And, the, and we have similar arguments made today by atheists and theological liberals, right? Um, which is relevant. We'll talk a little bit about that um, later. And this is in stark contrast to the Christian whose very anchor in the trials and suffering of this life is nothing more than the goodness of God. And that though God has decreed for evil and suffering to persist for a time, it is ultimately for a good and meaningful purpose, which will bring about not only glory and praise to God, but will also result in the eternal good of his people. As Paul writes in Romans 8.28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And in 2 Corinthians 4.16-17, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. So the eternal good purpose of God is a firm foundation upon which we can stand in the midst of suffering. But Gnosticism has no such foundation. There is no purpose of the one in their religion. As we have already seen from the Gnostic myth so far, the creation of the physical world was a mistake. The Gnostic God, right, the One, never intended to bring creation about. It was a result of a rebellious aeon bringing forth an illegitimate Gnostic, uh, ignorant child, right? So what happens next in the Gnostic story? I know you're all on the edge of your seats. <laughs> Yahweh creates the physical world, and he also creates Adam and Eve. Now, at this point in the narrative, the different traditions diverge a bit, but ultimately the divine spark or a part of the essence of Sophia gets transferred to Adam and Eve somehow. Um, one of the thoughts is that the, uh, so once Sophia realized what she did, she went back to the other aeons and was like, I've made a mistake. And meanwhile, Yahweh's on earth trying to figure out how to create something in his own image. And he makes this human, but he has no way of figuring out, well, how do I make this thing alive? And the aeons tell Yahweh, uh, breathe into him, right? And so in, and Yahweh has the divine spark of Sophia in him. And so he breathes into Adam and Eve. He himself loses the divine spark. Adam and Eve um, receive it, right? So that's one of the, one of the myths uh, on how that actually happened. But this is the mythic origin of the Gnostic anthropology, right? This is their view of humanity. That humans each contain spiritual sparks or pieces of the divine essence trapped in physical bodies, almost like a prison. So man, in the Gnostic view, is actually superior in his being to that of the demiurge Yahweh, because Yahweh doesn't have the divine spark in him. And as a result, Yahweh devises a plan to keep Adam and Eve ignorant of their true nature. So what do you think he did? Any ideas? <laughs> okay, well, before he says don't eat from the tree, he places them in a garden. He places them in a garden to keep them distracted from their divine spark within them. And every tree in the garden was full of fruit that would keep them ignorant of their true nature, except for one. Any guesses as to which one that might be? It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And by partaking of this tree, they passed, when they did so, they passed from ignorance into the knowledge of their true divinity. And this realization or enlightenment is what Gnostic salvation is all about. Do you guys see how this is the exact opposite of Christianity? It's twisted. So let's talk about Gnostic soteriology for a minute. Are we clear so far before we move on? Good, okay. So let's talk about Gnostic soteriology. In opposition to the scriptural teaching, the Gnostics viewed the fall as a good thing, as we just mentioned. It was the moment that Adam and Eve broke free from the deluding inf influence of Yahweh and came to realize their true selves. And this is really a blueprint for Gnostic salvation as a whole. That through the acquisition of secret knowledge, specifically regarding the true nature of this world and your identity, you can be set free from this fleshly corrupt world and ascend back to and be absorbed back into the fullness that is where your divine spark originated. And so in Gnosticism, your problem isn't sin, but rather ignorance. You don't need atonement, but rather enlightenment. 
You don't need to be redeemed, but rather you need to realize your true identity. So this, if this is their view of salvation, what role does Jesus play? Jesus' identity in Gnosticism is that of a divine teacher sent to teach men about this secret knowledge. In fact, guess who convinces Adam and Eve to eat at the fruit in the Gnostic story? I think you guys are catching on, right? Is it Satan? Jesus. The Christ. He is the one who tells the image bearers of God that you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And in partaking of the fruit, their eyes are opened, and this is a good thing, according to the Gnostic. Unlike the biblical Christ, he is not the second person of the Trinity, Yahweh in flesh, but rather he is a divine being sent from, quote unquote, the one to teach men how to be liberated from the oppression of Yahweh. So in essence, he's greater than Yahweh. And though he appears in the likeness of flesh, he's not actually human. Remember, for the Gnostic, matter is inherently evil. So if Jesus is perfectly good and holy, he could not have taken on a physical body. This teaching or tendency is referred to as docetism which downplays the humanity of Jesus. So for the Gnostic, Jesus only appeared to be human. And not only that, Jesus only appeared to die on the cross. That actually didn't happen either. And it is in response to this type of teaching, docetism, that John writes in 1 John 4, 1 through 3, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. <coughs> the word John uses for Antichrist is Antichristos, which means the one who assumes the guise of Christ, yet opposes Christ. Can you think of a more accurate title to describe the Gnostic heresy? Christ did not come to redeem, atone, cleanse, or forgive. He did not come to bear our sins and die on the cross to reconcile us to God. Instead, they present a false Christ who comes to tell you that you are more important and more special than you could ever imagine. You're actually divine, superior to Yahweh himself. And you need to transcend this physical evil creation and return to the one divine source. The Gnostics teach that the true God, Yahweh, is a liar and a fool, indeed the very devil himself. And the ancient serpent, the devil, whose lies plunged the human race into corruption in the first place, is presented as Christ. The Gnostic heresy blatantly points people away from God and away from his word, and instead instruct men to listen to the voice of Satan himself. We mentioned before the tragic nature of the Gnostic worldview, but now I think it's necessary to mention how arrogant and self-exalting their doctrines actually are. The Gnostic gospel gives the depraved sinner exactly what they want. The original sin was, in essence, man seeking to be God. And the Gnostics tell men, God is exactly who you are. And the secret to salvation is realizing that. So how did this worldview affect the way the Gnostics lived in the world? What did their theology look like when they applied it to their life? It ended up resulting in one of two divergent lifestyles. Some Gnostics, in their effort to liberate themselves from the body, engaged in asceticism. They practiced lifelong abstinence and had strict dietary rules, among other things. And this practice grew out of their view of the creation, right? This physical world was evil by nature, and so by their asceticism, they mitigated their interaction and participation in it, which they saw as inherently corrupt, right? So they're, they're trying to keep themselves from the physical world as much as possible. On the other hand, there were Gnostics that took a different approach. Instead of a rigorous asceticism, they opted for licentiousness or blatant antinomianism. And this also grew out of their view of creation, but specifically as it related to their anthropology. But unlike the Gnostic ascetics who desired to abstain from worldly involvement, these Gnostics embraced the fact that this world is not the ultimate reality. Their true reality, the true self, was not physical, but spiritual. So they did not see what they did in the body as of being in any consequence. 
Now, as Christians, we would see problems with both Gnostic applications. We disagree with the Gnostic ascetics about the nature of creation. We believe that it is inherently good and that God's creation and life in it is something to be enjoyed. Obviously, we are to do so with spirit rot, uh, the spirit wrought fruit of self-control and should not sinfully participate in the abuse of God's good gifts. But nevertheless, we ought to praise God for the good and gracious blessings that he has given us as his creatures. And we also disagree with the antinomian Gnostic. As Christians, we recognize the goodness and value of the law of God, which he has written on the tablet of the regenerate heart. We long to live in a way that pleases God in thought, word, and deed, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so we recognize that man is an integrated being. He cannot be partitioned into two separate parts that have no interaction with one another. <clears throat> I think there's actually something to be said about this stark, dualistic view of man and how it has affected the way even secular culture views the reality of being human. This compartmentalization of man into the physical self and the true self has had a very relevant effect on the way the culture today talks about identity and how people view who they are. The Gnostic view of man has resulted in what certain theologians call the culture of self-invention. And this topic has particular relevance when addressing the gender identity movement. If the body is of no consequence, if who I really am is not my physical self, but rather my true inner or spiritual self, then my own self, my own self perception is the ultimate reality. So instead of seeing themselves as an integrated being whose identity is given to them by God and is composed holistically of body, soul, and spirit as an image bearer of God, they make the harsh distinction between their body and who they truly are. The origin of such thinking stems back from Gnostic, through Gnostic thought and finds its root in Greek anthropology. So we're going to be moving on to kind of modern Gnostic thought, modern application. Was there anything as far as the foundation historically, what the Gnostics believed, what they thought that you would like clarification on before moving forward? Pretty good? Pretty clear? Okay. Good. So what I want to do now is take a quick look at how Gnostic thought has influenced the religious world today. Are there still Gnostics around today? Yes, there are. I've already, I've already quoted one. Uh, but their influence extends even into the pop culture of today. If you're familiar with Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, that has all kinds of conspiratorial theories about the true Gnostic origins of Christianity, right? Um, and that kind of has captured the modern imagination about, oh, you know, the Catholic Church has suppressed the true nature of Jesus and all that stuff. Um, and then you had the discovery of the Gnostic Gospels in 1945 um, and, and the Jesus Seminar uh, introducing, you know, the Gospel of Thomas belongs in the canon, right? There's all of these, these pushes to recognize these as true scripture. Um, and then again, every time you turn on the History Channel around Easter or Christmas, right, there's the true Jesus, right? And it's like, the Gospel of Judas, right? There, whatever it is. Um, and there's some creepy music or whatever. But I think that it would be more beneficial to look at how the Gnostic worldview has impacted the greater Christian world as a whole instead of, I mean, we could address, um, I think it's James White and uh, Michael Heiser have two separate uh, presentations on basically debunking the Da Vinci Code. If you guys are interested, they have a textual critical study and then a Gnosticism study about how Dan Brown got it all wrong, right? So those are interesting if, if you want to take a look at those. But I believe that Gnostic ideology has had a profound effect on modern religious thought as well. So I'd like to take a look at two specific examples, progressive Christianity and the believing Christian church. So progressive Christianity. How many of you ever heard a person claim that all religions express at their core the same universal truths, right? All religions are fundamentally the same. Or maybe you've heard a similar assertion that all paths lead to God. As Oprah puts it, one of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way to live. There are many paths to what you could call God. This is a very common way of speaking in more progressive or new age forms of so-called Christianity. And it is based on what is known as the perennial philosophy, right? So that's, that's an important phrase to know, right? The perennial philosophy. This is a belief that there is an ancient and enduring stream of truth that all religions throughout history have drawn from. And so ultimately, 
All faith traditions are expressing the same ancient fundamental wisdom. And this wisdom is the perennial philosophy. And this modern form of perennialism finds its root in 15th and 16th century Renaissance thinkers who began to take interest in Neoplatonic thought. Now, wouldn't you know it, what is Neoplatonic thought? It is the syncretism of Eastern and Greek philosophy. And they were specifically interested in the metaphysical concept of the one. Sound familiar? In the study of this perennial philosophy, this ancient wisdom expressed by every religion, scholars have seen four fundamental assertions, right? So the perennial philosophy has four assertions. One, the world of matter and individual consciousness is only a partial reality. Two, it is in the nature of man to have an innate knowledge of the divine source and is some way united to it. Three, the nature of man is dualistic, the temporal corporeal self and the eternal divine spiritual self. Number four, it is the chief end of man to come to the realization of his divine self and identify with it and thus enter into salvation, enlightenment, etc. This perennial philosophy is nothing more than ancient Gnosticism, repackaged, reborn, whatever you want to call it. Those who are familiar with Gnosticism see this as very obvious. And this isn't just a connection that has been made by a select few. The Gnostic bishop of the Ecclesia Gnostica in Los Angeles, yes, there's a Gnostic church and it would be in Los Angeles, <laughs> uh, admits it outright when he says, the perennial philosophy is just another term for Gnosticism, ancient and modern. Unquote. And it is this philosophy, this wisdom, that is alive and well in the progressive Christian church. I want you to hear a progressive Christian pastor expound on John 3.16. And I want you to recognize to what extent ancient Gnosticism is being taught in this church. This is from Douglas United Church of Christ in Douglas, Michigan. They are, as it says on their website, a progressive and radically inclusive spiritual community. And they actually boast in the fact that they were one of the first churches in America to become open and affirming. So they pride themselves in being somewhat of a spearhead of the modern progressive movement. And if you're interested in what I say here, Mike Winger on his channel, if you're familiar with his ministry, does a entire uh, analysis of this sermon. Um, but this, this excerpt is taken from that sermon. So here's what he has. Here's what this pastor has to say about John 3.16. <clears throat> so what does John 3.16 mean? What is he saying? Well, let's look at it together. If you notice in the gospel, Jesus is referring to terms like son of God, son of man, only begotten son. And he says things like all who believe in him will have eternal life. Why wouldn't he say all who believe in me will have eternal life? Why is Jesus talking in the third person? Jesus is not actually referring to himself. Son of God and only begotten son are terms for the Christ. And I've told you before, the Christ existed billions of years before Jesus of Nazareth. When God birthed everything into existence, he said, let there be light. And there was the Christ. The divine DNA was infused into all of creation. God so loved the world that God gave us of its very nature, its own DNA. Jesus was a man of Nazareth who lived more than 2,000 years ago. And during his lifetime, he had an awakening, a discovery, a realization that he and God were not two, but one. And because of that, Jesus was able to fully manifest the Christ. And he made it his mission after that realization to go into the world and to teach others that they too could experience this oneness with God. And he said, follow the way. Well, what is the way? The way of forgiveness, the way of service, the way of unconditional love, because Jesus knew that when you lived from this way, you stopped listening to the voice of the ego, the voice of the small self, the voice of separation and darkness, and you start to awaken more and more to the light of your true self to your divine self, unquote. This is the spirit that is alive and well in the progressive church. And though not all progressive Christianity is uniform in this regard, that is, not all people in the progressive movement are as out there as this guy is, it's not like he's alone in his progressive New Age Gnostic tendencies. These doctrines have had a significant impact on the liberal churches. Progressivechristianity.com, a flagship website for the movement, says as much. What does it mean to be a progressive Christian? He, they give eight points on their website. We'll look at the first two. 
Number one, we believe that following the path of the teacher Jesus can lead to healing and wholeness, a mystical connection to, quote unquote, God, as well as an awareness and experience of not only the sacred, but the oneness and unity of all life. We affirm the teaching, and this is the second point, we affirm the teachings of Jesus provide but one of many ways to experience, quote unquote, God, the sacredness, oneness, and unity of life, and that we can draw from diverse sources of wisdom, including earth, in our spiritual journey. So they're expressing their belief in the perennial philosophy, right? It's, it's pretty consistently all the way through. Dr. Peter Jones, who's a professor at Westminster Theological Seminary, gave, a, gave an address uh, at a conference. He's, he's one of the teachers with uh, Ligonier Ministries, and he really focuses on neo-paganism and Gnosticism in the modern culture. And during his address, he said this, quote, Hippolytus, one of the first, uh, one of the church fathers, noted this connection a long time ago. A long time ago, he documented that the so-called Christian Gnostics of his day, third century, were interfaith perennialists who sought the wisdom of the pagans, and that is what liberals have always done. They seek the wisdom of the pagans. The Christian Gnostics attended the ceremonies of the Isis worshiping mystery cults in order to understand the universal mystery or rather the perennial philosophy, unquote. He goes on to say in the same address, quote, I see in this Gnosticism revived a revival of liberalism. I believe that the first form of liberalism was Gnosticism because liberalism is the attempt to take the pagan culture around them and transform it by certain Christian terms in order to sell the Christian faith at a cheap price, unquote. And I think that he's got a really good point. In many modern liberal and progressive churches, we see the doctrines of Gnosticism being taught. An extreme dualistic view of creation, syncretism, the universal mystery of the perennial philosophy, the reception of secret knowledge that enlightens a person to the true nature of their divine self, and ultimately, when these doctrines are present, there is a fundamental denial of man's need for a savior and a denial of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that's how Gnosticism has affected the liberal church. But I don't think we have to look too far outside of our own conservative circles to see the effects of Gnosticism. And we're going to go ahead and end on, on this point. I do think the modern evangelical church has exhibited some Gnostic ways of thinking when it comes to certain things. Neglecting the means of grace, seeking mystical experience, downplaying the humanity of Christ, viewing the law of God as something to neglect, viewing the God of the Old Testament and his character as something qualitatively different than the one in the new. But I would say the most evident way Gnosticism has influenced the believing church is in our view of our eschatological hope. That is our ultimate hope for our future salvation. And here's what I mean. Is our hope ultimately to shed this mortal self escape from the body, leave this world behind, ascend to heaven, and exist in some far-off place, bodiless, floating around in some ethereal form? No. And yet this seems to be a very widespread perception of what a Christian's life after death will be like. Now, there is a state or period of time described in the scripture where after we die, we will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. That's true. But that's not our ultimate hope. <clears throat> The disembodied state between the Christian's death and resurrection is an anomaly. It isn't the state in which man was intended to persist. Christians throughout history have had the ultimate eschatological hope of resurrection and new creation. Christ didn't just redeem our spiritual self. Gregory of Nazianzus said that which Christ has not assumed, he has not redeemed. Well, Christ assumed a real human nature. He was like us in every respect, yet without sin. And he redeemed us through his mediating work, his physical, incarnate, life, death, and resurrection. And he redeemed us body, soul, and spirit. And so as opposed to the Gnostic, who wants to escape this world and be released from this fleshly prison, quote, we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. An embodied physical existence is not 
the problem. Sin is the problem. And we know that, quote, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to our mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in us. And so we look forward to the resurrection of the dead, an embodied existence, free from sin, not in some other realm, but in the new heavens and new earth, that is, a creation set free from its, from its bondage to corruption. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. From this perishable, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So hopefully, as we close, you can see, having looked at the Gnostic worldview, why it was such a problem for the Christians in the 2nd and 3rd century, and how it unfortunately remains the enduring heresy. I want to leave you with a uh, scripture reference, 1 Timothy 6, 20 through 21, where Paul says this to Timothy. And just keep in mind, gnosis means knowledge. 1 Timothy 6, 20 through 21. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. So I believe our hope should be to look to Christ, who is the source of all knowledge and wisdom for us. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, I pray that you would help us to come to a greater realization and appreciation of who you are, of your creation, its goodness, and every gift that you give us as your creatures. And I pray that you would help us to look forward with eagerness to that day when your creation will be set free from its bondage to corruption, that we will be set free from sin, that we will have a glorious resurrection and spend eternity with you. And we just pray that you would help us to grow in our affections for you and our commitment to serve you as we should. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.